of all, welcome to everybody who is here at the studio in Pittsburgh and to everybody who is joining us on Zoom, a warm welcome to you as well. My name is Ivan Taliancic. I'm a faculty member at the John Wells Directing Program at the Carnegie Mellon School of Drama. And I am beyond excited to have Katie Mitchell at the studio today as our guest artist. Katie is truly a giant on the international stage and is widely considered to be one of the most influential living theater and opera directors. She's also well known to the directing students in our program as her seminal book, The Director's Craft, is on their reading list. I am proud to have known Katie for literally the entirety of my professional career. And she has also been a generous presence at the School of Drama this semester. She has visited my Fundamentals of Directing class where she previewed her upcoming new book with our design and production students and will also be joining my MFA Director's Lab later this year. Um, this afternoon, we will be watching a recording of Katie's production of August Strindberg's Miss Julie or Fräulein Julie, which was staged in 2010 at Berlin's Schaubühne Theater. This production is an example of one particular thread within Katie's larger body of work, a technique she pioneered, which she refers to as live cinema. Um, I will let the work speak for itself. The recording runs about an hour and 20 minutes, after which we will take a short break and we'll then have a conversation with Katie, who will join us via Zoom. Uh, joining me on panel today will be the first and second year John Wells Directing Fellows, Jasmine Roth, B. Claymeyer, Carlos Martinez, and Tatiana Bakari, and my dear colleague, Erica Lata, the Assistant Professor of Theater Performance at the School for the Contemporary Arts at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, with whom we are partnering on this event and whose students will also be viewing this event via Zoom. Erica. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I would just would like to acknowledge before we start that here at Simon Fraser University, we work and live and create on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'm looking forward to our, our discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to the other partners who made this event possible. Nika Ross, the director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, as well as Dr. Harrison Apple, Bill Rogers, and Linda Hager for supporting this event with space, hospitality, marketing, and labor, as well as the funding through the 2022-23 Sylvia and David Steiner Speaker Series. This literally could not have been done without you. Um, everyone at the Carnegie Mellon School of Drama, and particularly my dear colleagues at the John Wells Directing Program, and last but not least, David Lan and Georgia Edker in London, who helped orchestrate all this. Please enjoy Fräulein Julie. I'm here. Speaking of the devil. In my nice hat in my Hamburg flat. Well, it's not my Hamburg flat. It's the Hamburg flat of my dear friend. How is Hamburg treating you? How are, how are, are you keeping those cherry trees in check? We are. Oh, good. The cherry trees are in check. They are behaving. The actors are very frustrated. Oh, of course. <laughs> because the trees are first, the actors are second. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. But um, please, everyone, join me in wishing a warm welcome to Katie Mitchell. Hey! Um, thank you so much for being with us today. So um, we are just going to dive into some, some questions. We're gonna put you in a hot seat. Um, and I wanted to start by um, just saying, obviously we just saw your extraordinary production of Fräulein Julie, um, which is one of those, um, as in Bogart would say, old chestnuts. So I've seen, I feel like I've seen so many productions of it over the years and one of the things that I um, felt was particularly unique about your rendition of the play was your decision to stage it from the pain point of view of a, what is normally considered a minor character, the housekeeper. Um, and that, so I wanted to, which I think was really possible in a way through your use of the technique of the live cinema. And in one of the, previous conversations, you have made the reference to how this particular way of working was helping you achieve this um, portrayal of female interiority. And so I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about 
that? Well, I suppose uh, the aim to sort of do the production from the point of view of the least important female character is also to notice how a lot of female experience is marginalized. And um, that it seemed really important to acknowledge that. And what doing this play from the point of view of the least important female character offers us is the sort of devastating emptiness in her interior life and how dependent she is upon what her partner is going to do or not do with the boss woman. Um, so I think in this case, it's quite a sort of sad interiority, sort of empty interiority that we're looking at. Someone who's so oppressed by patriarchal structures and systems that she doesn't have much space for her own private life and her own um, complex interiority. And I suppose that was a, a good way of asking a question about why we're so preoccupied with canonical productions of plays like Miss Julie, which are about not only the oppression of women in terms of the lead role, but also the oppression of women in terms of the minor roles. Um, and, um, and, and I suppose it's sort of asking why, why we do those plays, why we don't consider those plays as being no longer appropriate in the world in which we're, we're living. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other um, question that I wanted to ask you about is, so doing, choosing to do, to tackle a production through this approach, I feel like um, is such a monumental task because you're in a way doing the most challenging bit of what it, what's involved in making a theater play, considering that it all has to be in real time. Um, and at the same time, you're creating a film that is also in real time where you don't have an opportunity to do the first and second and third take and just make sure that you capture the best one. So how um, can you sort of pull the curtain a little bit and give us the backstage access pass for a minute and talk about how you prepare for a work of this kind? Well, I suppose the first thing that I did, and in fact, I was working in Copenhagen when I did it, and there was this very sort of snowy period, so everything outside was very white. And so the first thing I did is I cut the text, and I thought, well, if we only do it from the point of view of the least important female character, then let's cut the text around her experience. So when she's in the scene, we will do the scene, but when she leaves the scene, we won't do it any longer. So that's the first action is to sort of like cut the text with the conceptual eye in mind. And then once that's done, when we enter rehearsals, um, we have this cut version and we have five live cameras, the full film set, all the lights and sound. So we never work in any other environment other than with all the technology. And we would then look at, literally we'd do it scene by scene, working out how to shoot the action from the point of view of the least important female character. So there's a sort of rigorous application, conceptual application, and then all of the energies in the rehearsal room, the acting, the sound, the music, the cinematography, all are focused around achieving that one simple goal. How do we show this scene from the point of view of this least important female character with having cut the text to only look at the sections of the scene where she's there? And so it's very, um, it's very simple in one way, but very rigorous. And there's a, a German word, which I really love, which is the word consequent, which, which talks about how an idea is followed through to its end point, unflinchingly. It doesn't bend because it wants to entertain or it wants to please. It's following its political, and in this case, feminist agenda to its absolute end point. And I suppose most of rehearsals are me insisting that we are consequent. So even though it will produce work that can be quite hard, because you know it's very hard to only show those famous scenes in Miss Julie, the sections of them when that character is on, that's quite hard because people could get quite angry. But I think part of the, the main thrust of the process is insisting on the conceptual idea 
and 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 I think that's sort of part of what's really complex about maybe being a feminist or being a young person from a marginalized group is how do you how do you invite audiences into your outlook to the way that you perceive things and I think there can be a tendency to water down things and not to follow them through so that's what we're doing all the time in rehearsals I'm only asking one question how do we show it from the point of view of this woman what do we need to do and then everything is technologically focused on that task it's very exacting um erica oh it's my turn um hi katie it's such an honor um to meet you today um i just have two questions um what i find so beautiful in your work is how you embrace the artifice of it and you ask us to split our focus between being immersed inside a close-up and to remain in the sort of wide shot of a theatrical point of view at the same time how do you go about mapping or tracking the eye of the audience as they navigate between the close-up and the wide shot or do you just put those two things in dialogue i um, mean I, I think audiences are, are perfectly able to sort of select their own version of it. So I think everyone who turns up to this work makes their own edit. So some people just watch the screen and other people sort of edit between the live action at a stage level and the screen. So I became very interested in a world in which the audience is invited to construct their own event. And you you provide them with a whole range of, of different um perceptions or points of view from which they can then construct their own event but but i also became interested in uh, art movements like cubism where you would be seeing all the facets at the same time so i really like the idea that you see the constructed artifact of the film and the process of construction at the same time because theater is by its very nature fake it's not happening and um there's something great about drawing attention to its fakeness whilst also showing the brilliance with which it can submerge people in different realities um, and there's something about the simultaneity of that and declaring that which i think is is very healthy giving, giving him the eye. i can't control the eye i learned yeah. very early on that i can even in not even in naturalistic work that i did that i cannot control the eye of the audience so you can't do that. You think you're doing that, but you're not. The eye could wander wherever it was across the canvas of what it sees. Um, and so this way is, is a way of acknowledging that. It goes, well, it, we can't control what the audience see or experience. We can just invite them to select from a range of different choices. Beautiful. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, on a personal level, I'm working on a piece with my students next spring, um, inspired by Francois Truffaut's uh, Day for Night, about a film crew uh, making a film. And in this particular piece, dramaturgically speaking, we can sort of justify the presence of the camera. Um, so can you talk about how you use the presence of the actual camera to support the dramaturgy or to further reveal the artifice, as you say, of making the film? And do you think about that and when you use it? Um, well, I suppose I'm, I'm using the camera to challenge the male gaze. So exactly. the camera in these productions is very much about providing the female gaze. So what I've noticed in naturalistic production without technology is that how, however hard I try to look at female experience the habit of the audience was to look at the interiority of the male experience so I, I couldn't whatever I, I did on stage I couldn't insist that they looked with a female gaze at the female characters but the camera means that I can insist on the gaze. I can force the audience to watch the female experience because I'm not offering them very much else. Of course, in the wide shot, they can see a range of detail, but actually the thing that the camera provides me is the outlook of the female character, how she looks out at the world. So for me, it's less to do with technology and it's more to do with gaze. And in the case of the work that I'm in, 
been doing, it's to do with the marginalized female gaze. So in mainstream theater work, it's enormously hard to break the habit of the male gaze, whatever you do on stage, but you bring the camera in and you can force it. And, mm. and also if you, alongside that, you cut sections of canonical text, you can make it even clearer what you're asking the audience to look at and reflect on. Um, so, so for me, as I said, it's, it's not a technical or mechanical thing. It's an emotional slash political act, bringing cameras into, into theatre. Mm. Um, it's, it's insisting on how I would want the audience to view the material. I, I'm not giving them a choice about the prism mm. at all. So the camera comes in to do that. If the camera isn't there, they can look at it in their habitual ways of looking at it. But if I bring the camera in, then it forces them. But of course, it, I think it creates a byproduct thing, which I think maybe what you're making us think about, which is what does it mean doing the combination of live performance and the sort of technology of filmmaking? How does that sort of dance together? Um, well, yeah, I mean, like, and I think that's. Mm. Like Ivo van Hove is showing the ca the the camera in the in the wide shot, but he's not necessarily justifying the camera within the frame. And, and so I'm I'm some some pieces that you've done, the camera is part of the dramaturgy as well. It's and then mm -hmm. some that it's outside of that. It's in the artifice land. And I was curious also mm -hmm. about that layer. No, I, like, I I think we, we use it in both ways. And I think it's really lovely that you're identifying those two different functions. But the camera came into the practice because of the frustration with the male gaze. Yeah. So it came from a political point. It may have evolved and be used in different ways, but always it's centering around female experience. Um, and and mm -hmm. I think just acknowledging the habits we have of making theatre, constructing theatre, watching theater which is all about patriarchy mm. yeah <laughs> thank you okay. you know that you know that as well as me <laughs> exactly i know you very well <laughs> thank you so much hi katie uh, my name is tatiana i'm a first year graduate director um hi, tatiana. I would, hi i would love to um ask you about the double um I was my eye was very drawn to her double and I was aware that there was a practical component to this of you know continuing the action and transitions keeping them going smoothly but I started to wonder about the kind of voyeurism created by seeing her looking in on herself and I was curious how you thought about that and hearing you talk about this and now thinking oh and it's also adding another female body onto the stage um I'm just curious to hear about how you were thinking about uh, that function in, in the storytelling well as you notice there's a sort of mechanical need to have two of them in order to do all of the shots so so well spotted um and the second thing is about the representation of character. So I think there's a sort of, there's a, a habit of thinking that this single actor represents character. And I'm very interested in the idea that two characters, two women could construct one character. And um, I suppose that to me speaks to theories of self. So if we imagine that there's a sort of old fashioned way of thinking about the self, it's like there's a little sort of man who drives the car of our self and our self is a fixed construction. It doesn't change. We're really certain of our self. That's one theory of our self. And then if you think about like, I don't know, Hélène Sitsou, who's a French feminist, her theory of self is that we are not fixed in any way. In every interaction we have, we are changed and reimagined and reinvented. So there is no sense of fixed self. So, part of having two actors playing one character is also investigating questions of identity and selfhood you know so there's there's just a habit in theater practice that one very ego driven actor embodies one very ego driven character but i just wonder is there another way of constructing character 
where three or four actors could construct one complex picture of self. So the um, the doubling is a sort of little nod to sort of theories of, of self and identity that we're sort of interested in exploring in this work. Lovely, thank you. Hi, Katie, I'm Jasmine. I'm one of the second year uh, MFA grad directors. Hi, Jasmine. So nice to meet you and be able to chat with you for a few minutes. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about your approach to rhythm and tempo in this piece. And specifically as hearing you talk about the male gaze and deconstructing that, I'm wondering if within your approach to rhythm and tempo and the, the architecture of the arc of the play, if you're also deconstructing the male gaze within that or how you're conceptualizing that. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question because you could say that if you were to present Strindberg's original architecture and original dramaturgy, it would have a certain sort of rhythm and structure and tempi. And by sort of replacing it with a sort of new um, dramaturgy, which comes literally by following this female character, you have a, another template, another dramaturgical template and another sort of rhythm and structure. But the thing that's quite interesting is that they're not dissimilar. So the original dramaturgical structure and then the feminist intervention follows the same lines rhythmically. There's a little more of a hiatus in the middle bit where the big sex scenes happen in the original play, but in, in our feminist reiteration, it's just we watch the woman go to sleep with flowers under her pillow, so it's a, a little duller. But other than that, it's the same architecture. And actually it becomes dramaturgically and rhythmically more interesting at the end because the play doesn't actually give an answer to what happened, but the feminist reading does give an answer. So we see the completed sort of suicide. But without doubt, it's a, it's a really interesting question because if you're replacing canonical patriarchal structures, which have their own rhythmic, rhythmic rules, if you like, what do you replace them with? And does it have the same value or is it a whole new rhythm and structure? And I think it, it's something that can, can't be sort of like, under investigated so it's something to really really sort of reflect on so so thank you for that question that's a really thoughtful really thoughtful question thank you hi katie i'm b i'm also a second year graduate hi. director nice to meet you so good to talk um i'm interested in this examination of the female interiority these moments of cruelty and uh masculinity and where they show up I'm thinking specifically right now about the moment of the killing of the bird and what it does to us as an audience when you sort of deconstruct that moment. We have the sound over here, the image over here, and then it's all reconstructed in the screen. And what we're seeing is not the bird, but actually, you know, the women responding to the bird. And what does that do to these moments of cruelty? Well, I suppose... Um by breaking it up into its components it's very clear to, to um we can see the uh, perpetrator more clearly mm -hmm. so we we can see the male perpetrator um but we're not damaging an actual bird so that's that's really right. important um and as you so rightly say we're looking at the female experience but actually we're prioritizing one woman over another so there's an intersection into sort of class and, and social things as well. So we're, we're sort of deprioritizing the rich girl's experience and reprioritizing the poor woman's experience, if you sort of mean. So it, it's quite a complex sequence to sort of put together. And it's a really interesting one to sort of draw our attention to, I think. And um, I think hopefully you emerge from that sequence with all of the sort of deconstructed elements being able to understand why a man in that culture would do what he does and how it affects a rich woman also oppressed in that patriarchal culture and how finally at the bottom of the pile it affects another woman who's looking through the crack in the door so it sort of helps us sort of break things down into all its components so you can see the full complexity of that sadism or, or cruelty towards animals um, and I think sometimes when you watch the show, if it's not deconstructed like that, you could get off on the violence or you could yeah. mis misconstrue the violence or you could find it unacceptably offensive. 
So the, the breaking down into lots of components, I think, allows it acknowledges everyone's full range of experience and it accurately allocates the blame for the violence. What do you think? I, I agree. I also think there's something so Greek about what you've done with it and finding myself being able to watch the creation of sound in that moment was actually quite horrifying. Um, and yeah, I thought that was really beautiful. And why was that? Because of the horribleness of the, the sound of the neck being broken of the bird. Uh, the flapping of the wings actually was, was it for me. Seeing um, them uh, create that sound so violently um, really but I think took, me, it, took us somewhere else. It's really interesting, isn't it? All of us are inside a patriarchal system and all of us experience different um, forms of oppression. Be, be us male or female or um, non-binary, you know, we all, all experience different forms of, of oppression from it. And I just think it's really important to identify all of the components of it. Yeah, totally. So that, so that we can just position ourselves in relationship to it. Otherwise, we just get invited to be swept away with the habit of how to think about it and how to feel about it. When um, as sort of theatre makers, maybe there's another way of, of of inviting audiences into those sorts of experiences. And the reminder that that moment of cruelty affected everyone on stage and not just this privileged, rich that's right. woman. Yeah, that's right. That's right. On another if note, I was wondering if I could ask you not about this show, but what's inspiring you right now? What are you reading right now? Looking at right now? I'm reading a book called uh, it's by Elizabeth Colbert about the, the sixth extinction. Is that what it's called? Something like that. Yeah, it's an American book because I'm working with an American writer called Miranda Rose Hall on on a play about um, climate change and extinction. So. So the thing that's really inspiring me in an awful way <laughs> is um, climate change. That's awesome. I love Miranda. She's a friend. Uh, she's... But I was very inspired recently, less by the book that I was reading and more by the young people. You know, they're, they're called in Europe, have you heard about them? They're called The Last Generation. Yeah. And they um, went to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, didn't they? And sort of put themselves in the white suits and stopped the jets flying. So, um, and then there was a very good book that I was reading recently about how to be a joyful environmentalist, which was which was very good by by a young woman. So, um, all, always lots of things to read about the difficult things about being alive. Thank you so much. Hello, Katie. My name is Carlo Martinez. I'm Hi, Carlo. Other, hi. I'm the other first year graduate director. Uh, my question is, hypothetically speaking, if you were to restage this production today and this year, would you change anything? Would you enhance anything considering the political climate where we're finding ourselves in compared to a decade ago? I wouldn't do it. Brilliant. <laughs> because because I think um, we're in such a, a very difficult time, aren't we now? I mean, what do I mean? I, I mean, all of us have sort of lived through a very complex existential um, challenge because of, uh, of COVID. And um, also, obviously, in your country, you've been through Trump, you've been through Black Lives Matter. Um, and in my country, we're going through awful periods of sort of right wing ridiculousness. And there's a war going on in the Ukraine. So I think that all that's happened over the last few years means that we have to totally examine the work that we we were doing before and ask ourselves, you know, what, what do people need now? What type of work should we make now? And, and in my view now, I think all theatre performance needs to be a political event now. So there's, we can't return to who we were before or what we did before or what we thought before, because the world is just in such a different turbulent um, period. So uh, I would never direct that piece now. Absolutely not. It was great then. Um, and now, as I'm sure Ivan has told you, I'm doing the cherry orchard from the point of view of the trees. So I'm doing a, a political um, attack on the canon from the point of view of the more than human world, because that seems to be the urgent thing at the moment. But what do you think is the urgent thing at the moment? Oh no, I'm not ready for that question. 
Yes, yes, you are. I'll leave it for someone else. Cool. Um, so yeah, we are gonna open it up for our audience, and I see three eyes very eager to ask a question here. Bill is gonna give you a microphone. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask mine because it kind of uh, connects. Oh, what? Oh, I, I prefer, I'll come over here because my question connects to yours. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> this is so weird. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you were just talking about like how the work that you create has changed over time in response to the environment you're creating the work in. And I was wondering about like just generally your artistic development. Something I really admire about your work is that it is so rigorous, so intense. Seemingly, I, I watch what you do and I'm like, I that's that seems impossible to me, but it's incredible that you managed to make it happen. And I was wondering, um, like, but before creating this work and over the course of your career, how you think your particular aesthetic and value system sort of solidified and what age you feel like that solidified um, from when you started directing theater to when you feel like you really solidified cool. that particular perspective. And how, how old are you now? Yeah, this is a very narcissistic question. I'm 21. So I'm, I'm like, maybe in like five years, I can use a camera on stage or something. Well, no, you, you can do whatever you want whenever you're ready to do it. I suppose, um, so you're 21 and I'm 58. So we, we're talking about quite a, a long sort of period of time. And I suppose the question may be about you as a young female artist, you're working out when you can sort of start to sort of feel solid about what you want to articulate and how you want to articulate it. And I suppose if I if I look back and imagine myself at your age, 21, I realized that I was diverted from the things that really grew to interest me because I wanted to please a lot of other people and I wanted to belong and I wanted to sort of be a good girl for want of a better way of putting it. And I think I wasted about 20 years. So I, I, I would say that <clears throat> when I look back, I wasn't interested in most of the theater that was happening around me. I found it really boring. I found people like Liz Lecomte at the Worcester Group very interesting and similar companies like that. But the mainstream theater, I found it deadly boring. And yet I wanted to belong, I needed the validation. So I got stuck in it for 20 years. And then um, after those 20 years, I thought I want to go back to do my cameras like Liz Lecomte was doing in the 1980s when I saw the Worcester group. And so I started to use the cameras in the work. And I did a production of the uh, Waves by Virginia Woolf. And then I was set off on my next task. So thinking back over the evolution of, uh, of my practice, I would say the thing that is really important is to listen authentically to the tiny quiet voice that indicates the things that actually interest you. And then finding the confidence to turn down the volume on the voices around you that suggest that that interest has no value. So of course, you know, you can look at a career and you can see it as a series of mechanical things that happen over time that lead to success or not. But the interior experience is really different. So the interior experience is finding the confidence to listen to what actually interests you and to actually manifest it in the world. Does that make sense? Even though people will think that you're mad or stupid or silly or female, whatever it is. Does that help answer your question? It helps answer my question. It's an incredible thing to hear. So I appreciate you saying all that. Do you regret those 20 years though, or do you still value that experience? No, because the benefit was by the time I'd worked out what I wanted to do, I had a fuck of a lot of skill. <laughs> so I had 20, <laughs> 20 years of skill to use to execute what I wanted to do. And I think that's the hard thing is where you have the idea versus the skill. So I, I don't regret it because I wasn't able to do it before. So regret is a sort of like a really weird thing because you regret what you're not able to do. So I wasn't able to do it until I was able to do it. Um, so no, I, I don't regret it. And, it. and it had an advantage. There's a great French feminist called Marguerite Eusenar. And she wrote a great book called The Memoirs of Hadrian, which is definitely worth reading. And in the book, she talks about 
Whenever there is a difficult situation that you face or problem that you face, you have to ask yourself, where is the advantage? So after my 20 years, when I started to work on my live cinema work, I asked myself, where is the advantage? And I said, I've got 20 years worth of skill now. So I think it's always looking for that advantage, but no regrets. Regret is a pointless activity, sadly. Thank more, you so more much. More questions? All right. Hi, Katie. Uh, I'm alone. I'm an undergraduate director. And Hiya. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, I've se after seeing this, and I also just recently saw a production of Die Valkyrie that had similar live cinema tactics. Uh, you were talking about in your process wanting to service the... Um, the underrepresented perspective. So I was wondering, do you do you storyboard like the final product of the camera first and then figure out sort of the choreography of what needs to happen in the physical space? Or do you focus more on the physical space first and then figure out what that's gonna look like on camera or toggle between the two, if that makes that sense. That is such an important question. Well asked. It's all about the camera. So it's literally about what we're going to see. That's the only thing that interests us. And we have two types of rehearsing. One where we work out shot by shot what we're going to see. And then the second type of rehearsals, which are called threading, where we do all the work out mechanically how we're going to run all of those shots together. And where we've got five cameras, they've all got cables. So we do these ghastly rehearsals where someone says, move camera number one, two meters to the right, under the cable of camera number two, and then round the back of camera number three. And the, these are threading rehearsals. So we're only driven by the image. And then the mechanics of what happens on stage has to follow behind the image. But a very, very cunning question. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have to say, I, I only represent one marginalized group, which is just within my lived experience, which is obviously is female experience. And, and obviously I'm a sort of white cis woman, so I have many limits. I just wanted to say that, so I wouldn't make any claims to represent any other marginalized groups, just so that's clear. Uh, we have a, a question from Zoom from Sharon. Um, Hi, Sharon. Who, who wants to know, um, is music used as a character in this piece of work? And if it is, how so? Very good question. Um, well, the music favors the experience of the least important female character. So um, the, the music is built to support her emotional experience and to favor that. And in fact, now we're doing the cherry orchard from the point of view of the trees. We've got a live string quartet who are supporting the experience of the trees and the birds and the insects and the wasps and the badgers and all of the more than human world. So yes, it's a very good question. The music is helping support the um, prism of the least important female character. So in that sense, the music isn't another character, but it supports the construction of another character. I'm going to piggyback on that cherry orchard, which just sounds so cool. Um, and because we, you know, we had this conversation and I just wanted to um, wanted you to share a little bit more as to what happens when you are depicting the story of the play through the experience of the trees and the birds. Like how, what happens to the characters? How is the text well, the perceived? Is, the characters, all the actors are in a sound sealed box and they do the whole text. Um, they speak it all and they act it all. And we just turn the volume down for most of it. And um, so we see the badgers or the hedgehogs or the birds. And every now and again, we, we turn the volume up on those human beings when they're talking about the cherry orchard for a little bit. Then we just turn the volume down. So we see them doing this. Meanwhile, we're watching a bird eat a cherry or we're watching the bees come out of their hive ready to do all the pollination. So the thing about it is that it's a one-off production. You can only do it once, you know, and it will probably fail. So it starts, I think, with the words like, to begin with, when you go into the auditorium, there's a, it's, there's a black screen, and then the words come up slowly, 
bit by bit and they go something like if we keep abusing nature it will collapse word by word if we're just sticking these things taking us with it and then we do the whole of the cherry orchard but really we barely hear the humans at all and there is a green screen so every now and again when the fuckers the human beings walk through the orchard we put them on screen and we hear what they're saying but they don't seem to notice anything that's important in the orchard. They walk through the orchard with all of their emotional concerns. And then right at the end, it's 52 minutes, the whole show, like this. There's also a string quartet in the sound seal box that plays a soundtrack for nature. And then right at the end, we do a 20 minute rewind of the whole show. So we, from the moment of soaring down the trees, we then rewind through the whole show and then we go right the way back to that final word, if, and then it's a blackout. So it says that if, if we were to have a second chance at it, would we cut down our orchard or not? No, hopefully is gonna be the answer. But it, it's, it's a willful piece of agitprop and I'm sure it's gonna <laughs> empty the theaters and I'm sure no one's gonna ever want to see the cherry orchard like that again. But, but the thing is, it's really important because it's it's COP now, you know, the big climate change conference. So now is the moment, really. So that's that's what you see. It's very irritating show, but it's very. Your, good. It's, your, <laughs> it's your one shot deal, Katie. That's it. That's it. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, it's really great to uh, see you here. I'm Ursula, I'm a first year dramaturg, and I'm specifically studying to become a dramaturg in opera, in the opera industry. And I know that you have lots of experience in the opera industry. And I, is there any specific advice you would have on working in the opera industry in particular? Because I know, <laughs> I know it is quite a uh, environment. <laughs> yeah, well, I would, as a duty of care, I would have to say to you that it's not a safe working environment. So unfortunately, the opera world is not able to fully respect the rights of, of, of citizens. So it's quite sexist and racist, but I'm sure you must know all of those things. So I, I would say that you must approach it with care. But because it is so awfully old fashioned, it is ready for revolution. So if you can keep yourself safe as a citizen in that environment, you must revolutionize it because it is a dead art form um, and, it, and it really needs revolution. And at its best, it can be really exciting, which is why I'm sure you're really thrilled by it. But as a young woman approaching it, it's a bastion of patriarchal values. You know, it's really, really tricky. Um, I teach opera directing actually at Columbia and we talk a lot about um, very detailed rewriting of the canonical stories. So I think dramaturgically your job is to rewrite the canon. That, that, that for me is, is the thing that, that, that really needs doing. So I just did Theodora recently, which is an opera about a passive woman who ends up dying passively with her lover. I mean, why would we want to watch that? So I thought, well, I can't show that. So I made her instead of someone who was like passively um, saying, Oh, I'll take anything that happens to me. I, I made her someone who was constructing bombs to blow up the Roman Empire. And at the end, um, she did a Thelma and Louise sequence. She got a gun in slow motion and she killed all the Roman perpetrators in slow motion in the last year and headed off with her lover into the future. So I would say rewrite the canon, be fearless. Don't listen to any of those patriarchs, but stay safe. Thank you. I, I intend to do that. Hopefully I will be successful. Yes. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm Hi, Daniel. 
Hi, um, I'm a first year undergrad director, and this is my first time consuming a piece of theater using this live cinema. So I guess I'm just trying to pick out like why we choose to tell it this way, like what stories are suited to tell it this way, and also having the attributes of showing us create the live cinema. Is that there to like show us how the art is made or is that also to contribute to the gaze that you tend to tell? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a tricky question, isn't it? I mean, I think if you if you haven't ever seen theatre like this, it must feel a bit strange, because it seems to sort of like be a bit full of lots of contradictions. Is that right? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think I'm still able to like appreciate like the art that was up there, but it was definitely interesting to watch. Also, the actors how they made it happen live every day on that stage, and I guess because also you brought up like how like it's impossible for our audience to pick up everything we give them. And you've added this sort of element that can, some people might use the word distracting. So I'm mm -hmm. also curious like how you navigate that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, I used to say that it, um, if, if we think about um, what theater does is it tries to sort of organize our actual experience of being alive in a form which doesn't represent our actual experience of being alive because our actual experience of being alive is much more chaotic and fragmented and broken. And um, it, it's just a linear narrative with a hero who enters, goes through lots of events and emerges happy or sad is miles from my lived experience. And I'm sure it's a long way from everyone else's lived experience. So there's something about the art form, this live cinema art form, which is also trying to be a bit more honest about how fragmentary our actual experience of being alive is. It's not so sort of like organized, let's say, as a well-made play. That's why I think we love plays, because we think, oh, yeah, that's great. that's great. If it was like in a play, life would be much easier. But actually, it's much more fragmented than that. Um, so I used to think that. But then recently, my daughter was diagnosed with ADHD. And then I began to think that, oh, yeah, maybe I'm the one who who transmitted the ADHD to her, and maybe what I'm actually reflecting is a neurodiverse outlook. And oh, that the young woman there is just clicking her fingers. Why are you clicking your fingers like that? Do you tell me on the microphone what you think? I love that as a fellow ADHD neurodivergent person, I, I see that and I feel that in, in your work. And I love work that feels like it it can like I feel like I have a special relationship to stimulation um, from that neurodivergent perspective and can take multiple things happening at once and those different layers in a way that um, I cannot often be bored or understimulated in other ways so there's actually in the fragmentation a creation of more continuity that works for my brain. No, but it's so interesting that you should say that because I really did reflect on it after my daughter was diagnosed, which is literally a couple of months ago, I thought, where did where did it come from? Did it come from you, Katie? And then you thought, oh, my days, you're doing simultaneity all the time. Does that actually reflect a neurodivergent perspective? One that you've always claimed was just like the perspective of normalcy or being human was how I used to classify it. So it's very interesting that you should you should sort of um, bring that up because it's a really important matter, isn't it? If if you have a neurodivergent outlook, um, how do you communicate and work with that and celebrate that as well? So yeah, my success may be pivoted on my neurodivergence. <laughs> That's it. That's so interesting. But I wouldn't have known because I came from a generation where those things weren't looked at or thought about but it's, it's great that you should say that that's good yeah thank you for sharing that okay so we have time for one more question which comes from the zoom before we let um katie wander into the misty hamburg night um uh this comes from alexandra um and she says thank you katie two questions touching on safety what does safety look like in a devised process for you also, what advice has held true for your for you throughout your practice career slash career? Uh, safety in terms of citizen safety. I assume so. Okay, so 
all artistic um, practice has to be put on a bed of 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 uh, safe practice and what does that mean to me that means that um everyone's rights in the rehearsal room as citizens are respected first that's that's the important thing so that that's definitely sort of the bedrock of it and that as someone who in traditional models has a lot of power because traditionally the director has a lot of power i have to be very thoughtful of and responsible with that and that means that i have to be very boundaried so i need to put very clear boundaries down between my private life and my professional practice um, and to not have any porosity and i have to be immaculately well behaved and thoughtful and consistent so and, and in a devised process i think it's even more important to have those clear boundaries and to respect everyone's rights as citizens because often you'd be inviting actors to sort of generate work from their own private life experience because they're not playing a character in a play. So I would say the more structured, the more boundaried, the more respectful, the better the working practice will be. Thank you. And on that note. Oh, well, good luck, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Pleasure. Nice to see you, Van. See you soon. Bye. We'll see you very soon. Bye.